Welcome back to the School of the Prophet Study. Today we're going to continue on in our study of the seven feasts and the Law of Moses. Today's feast that we're going to be studying is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Uh, there's a couple of verses I'd like to start out with. Uh, one to me that really helps us get focus, which is in Romans 11:36, And it says, For of him, and through him, and to him are all things. To whom be the glory forever. Amen. And really, when I think about the feast, this is what this is what goes through my mind. This is all about Jesus Christ. It's all about Him. It's all through Him. It's all to Him. And it's not so much about the days. It's not so much about the, the traditions. But it's about getting to know Jesus Christ. Getting to know what He expects of us and how to live right in this world that we live in. Uh, in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, of course, uh, the, the idea behind Unleavened Bread is that you're taking something out of the bread. And so we're going to see that theme throughout this feast. And there's a couple of scripture verses that kind of give us hints in our own time period how this applies. One of those is in Hebrews 10:22, And it says, Let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. And, and the word sprinkled there really, in a sense, means taken out. We've taken out of our hearts the evil conscience. We've removed the, the, the wrong things from us. As it says, our bodies washed with pure water. The idea being not so much that we're going to dump pure water over ourselves, but rather that we're going to purify our lives. We're going to get rid of something that is not good for us. And 2 Corinthians 5.21 for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so through Jesus Christ, who inevitably is the, the pureness that we need to wash with, uh, we can become pure. We can never do it on our own. We couldn't do it if we dedicate our lives and we were the strongest people in the world. We couldn't do it on our own. But through him, he was made sin for us and that sin in our own lives can be taken away and that's kind of the idea behind the, the unleavened bread you're taking something out of uh, the flesh the bread uh, it's an interesting thing I came across as I was doing this study uh, going through the, the Hebrew and whatnot and it's the word remes and of course the the word remes uh, uh, I you know reading I saw that rabbis would often say when you found a story that seemed to have unnecessary details, they called that a remis. And what it really means is that uh, the meaning of the story is only hinted at in the text itself. And I kind of think of that in a lot of the feasts. We read through the feasts and we see all these customs and practices, but, but as I look at them through Jesus, I see that the actual text is just hinting at what we're really supposed to see. It's not about taking leaven out of bread. That's not the most important thing. It's about looking at our own lives. Uh, when Jesus served the sacrament to his disciples and said, you know, to the cup, this wine is my blood, uh, this bread is my body. It wasn't so much about visualizing uh, his blood and his body, but rather visualizing our own lives and taking upon us Christ's flesh, which was perfect, and being washed in his blood that he shed for us that can help us in our path to perfection. Uh, so in this uh, study, we're going to be going over what is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, how did Christ fulfill it, what other important historical events may have fallen on this day, and what important events, if any, in the restoration of the Church of Christ fell on this day. Uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread uh, occurs in Nisan 1415, and it's considered the beginning of the harvest, the, what they was planted in the fall first passage we're going to read about uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread comes out of Exodus 12, verses 15 through 20. And it says, Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day unto the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. And in the first day there shall be a holy convocation. And in the seventh day there shall be a holy convocation to you. No manner of work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat, that only may be done of you. And ye shall observe the feast of unleavened bread 
For in the self same day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall ye observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. In the first day, on the fourteenth day of the month at even, ye shall eat unleavened bread until one and twentieth day on the, uh, of the month at even. Seven days shall there, shall there be no leaven found in your house. For whosoever eateth that which is leavened, even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he be a stranger or born in the land. Ye shall eat nothing leavened. In all of your habitations shall ye eat unleavened bread. And so there we have the, the, the feast and the description of what they were supposed to do as tradition dictated. And what we're really seeing here in many ways is the focus on taking something out and changing the way your life is. Uh, everyone has to do it. We all have to take uh, unrighteousness out of our life. Uh, we all have to observe it. And that's what God's talking about. When he says that when he took the people out of Egypt, it's what he did because the people themselves couldn't ever get out of Egypt. They were, they were slaves permanently in Egypt. Uh, the Pharaoh would never have let them go. But by the power of God, he took them out through his miracles. And that's what he's focusing on in our life. We cannot come out of our spiritual Egypt without God doing it and being a part of it. And so he brings us out of Egypt. We then choose to set aside our evil nature and take on a holy nature from Christ himself. I'd like to read in Leviticus 23, 6 through 8. In the fourteenth day of the four, first month at even is the Lord's Passover, and on the fifteenth day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto the Lord. Seven days ye must eat unleavened bread. In the first day ye shall have a holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days. In the seventh day is a holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein. And also in Exodus 13, verse 3 and verse 7. And Moses said unto the people, Remember this day, in which ye came out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. For by strength of hand the Lord brought you out from this place. There shall no leavened bread be eaten. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days. And there shall no leavened bread be seen with thee. Neither shall there be leaven seen with thee in all thy quarters. And so... The leaven was a very important thing. They had to take it out. Just like sin is a very important thing in our own life, we have to take it out. Uh, we, can't, we cannot exist in the, the presence of God with sin. And so by doing this symbolically, traditionally, they were constantly refocusing themselves on the importance of getting the leaven out. If they only ever did it once, it's, easy to, uh, it's an easy thing to forget. But by redoing it every year, it refocused them on the necessity to remove these things. And so in our own lives, we need to always refocus. We need to always re-examine ourselves. What else, what other leaven do we need to take out of our lives? God has done such a marvelous work and bring us out of the bondage of Egypt, the bondage of sin, the bondage of the, this world and what the devil has for us. What can we do to take out of our lives the rest of the leaven? through Jesus Christ, because in and of ourselves we can never do it. Uh, it talks about not doing work and whatnot on this day. And so in, in many ways this has become a Sabbath on the first day and a Sabbath on the last day. But throughout this time it's a dedication where, uh, you know, what you're doing is dedicated for God. It's not all about you. And too often in life we get too wrapped up that everything's all about me. And this is, a, a, again, a refocus. It's not just about us. It's about God. It's about His kingdom. In the traditions that uh, the Jews would often follow, we have uh, these traditions handed down to us. Before the Feast of Passover and unleavened bread could be celebrated, all the leaven was to be removed from the Hebrews' house. This required a great amount of spring house cleaning. Everything in the house was thoroughly washed, scrubbed, and cleaned. This included the walls, the ceilings, floors, furniture, cabinets, everything. The cooking ware was boiled in water, and there were special utensils that were used that had not been contaminated to be able to hold and work with the rest of the pots. 
so that you just didn't keep contaminating everything. Once the cleaning was complete, then the family would participate in a ceremony called the Bedekat Chametz. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but that's the Hebrew word, and, and what it means is search for leaven. After dark, the head of the house would take a lighted candle and diligently search through every nook and cranny in the house, looking for any hidden leaven. And that was the idea. If he found any, he would immediately remove it from the house. Today, ma many modern Jewish families still participate in the house cleaning and the search for leaven. Uh, just before Passover, crumbs of leavened bread are placed in each room in the house by one member of the family. Then the head of the house pronounces a benediction about removing leaven and proceeds to search for hidden leaven in the house. A family member goes along carrying a lighted candle to expose where the leaven is hidden. When the searcher discovers the leaven, he's careful not to touch it, not to be contaminated. To avoid contact, he takes a feather and brushes the leaven into a small wooden spoon. He then puts the leaven in a bag. When he's satisfied that he has found all the leaven, he puts the wooden spoon, the feather, and the candle into a bag and burns it. Finally, he says a prayer asking God to forgive them. Forgive the family for any hidden leaven they may have overlooked. With the leaven now purged from the household, the family is ready to celebrate the Passover and unleavened bread. The bread used during this time is called matzah bread, and this is, this is a bread without leaven in it. It's a bread that when it's made, uh, typically speaking, it's bruised, striped, and pierced. And uh, its translated name, uh, it's called the bread of affliction. Uh, in many ways symbolizing the affliction that Christ's own body would go through for us. And so eating this matzah bread at the, the sacrament, uh, Jesus Christ was a disciple eating the bread of affliction. When he handed the bread, of, the bread of affliction to his disciples and said, this is my body, what a profound meaning that would have had. Being able to look at it with the stripes, with the piercings, and understand that symbolically Christ is giving all of his uh, body for us that we might live. He's suffering these afflictions for our benefit. What a marvelous gift he's given to us. Some of the important parts in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, uh, which is actually an extension of the Passover, it was to take place the uh, it was to take place following the Passover and last for seven days. They were to go through their homes and clean out all leaven. They were to have a high Sabbath day, both the first day and the seventh day. In other words, uh, the first day was a Sabbath day to them, uh, just like. All sat the, the main Sabbaths, and the last day was a main Sabbath to them. Everything, everyone was to participate, even the stranger. It didn't matter who was in the land, everyone had to participate. And there was no leaven to be seen anywhere. Not in their homes, not in the towns, the stores couldn't sell leavened bread. It was to be eradicated for this time period. Looking at Christ's fulfillment in it, of course, we can see so many parallels in Christ and so many parallel, parallels in our view of who Christ is and what he did. One of the first points that was to be fulfilled relates to an Old Testament prophecy in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verse 27. And it says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for a week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cease, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. This gives us an amount of time that Jesus would be preaching the gospel. It also tells us that in the middle of the week, or on the third day, third year of his preaching, see prophecy of Jonas, Matthew 1240, Jesus would be cut off or crucified, but he would continue for four days or years to preach the gospel to the lost sheep. And we can see that in John 10, 16. Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. And they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. And of course we know that the Jews at the time thought that maybe he was going to go to the rest of the, uh, the people, the Gentiles outside of Israel, and preach to them also. But they didn't understand. 
that Jesus himself wasn't going to go to the Gentiles. That the disciples and their work through the Bible, that was what was going to go to the Gentiles and convert them. And we see, you know, that work beginning with Peter uh, when he goes uh, to the first uh, Gentiles and converts them. And it's marveled that, that Jesus, that God is also including the Gentiles in, uh, in this promise of salvation. And so you begin to have this coming together, not just of Jews, not just of Israelites, but of all people. Uh, Israelites, Gentiles, every nation, just like in the feast, everyone was to participate. Whether they were a stranger, whether they were a natural born, everyone was to participate. And that's what God wants. He's got open arms. Everyone is to participate. We also know that on the first day of this week, there was to be a high Sabbath. Also on the last day of this week, in Jesus' life, the first thing we have recorded of him doing after baptism was going to the wilderness for 40 days to fast and pray, thus sanctifying the beginning of his seven, seven years of preaching. And so he dedicated this time, this purifying, uh, essentially taking the leaven out. He went and purified himself, uh, fasting and praying for 40 days, and taking everything out. Not that he had sin in him, but the symbology is there, the removal of everything. And what's left is just, you know, what God can work with. During this time, they were to first cleanse out all leaven from their homes, and for the, these seven days eat no leaven. Jesus warns his disciples in Luke 20, 12, 1. Luke 12, 1. Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. And so we're not to have hypocrisy in our life. And symbolically, that's what it is. When we participate of the sacrament, the bread without leaven, what it's symbolically saying is we're coming here honestly, truthfully, pure. We're confessing our faults. We're confessing who and what we are. We're set aside, setting aside hypocrisy, and we're opening ourselves up to God. Examine us. And that's what his suffering was for. It was so that we could be examined and that we could be purified. He also tells us that he is our bread. In John 6, 47 through 51, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat man in the wilderness, and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof, and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And so here we have Jesus reiterating, He is it. It's not about a feast. It's not about a, sp uh, a particular time period. It's not about traditions. He is this bread, this unleavened bread. He has no hypocrisy in Him at all. He comes to us honestly and truthfully and tells us the way. And we can trust him wholeheartedly with all of our heart. He is the way. Uh, the Israelites ate manna that came down from heaven, but eventually they still died. It wasn't something that preserved their life forever, forever, even though it may have been food from heaven. Telling us that there is no perfect food in this world that can take us uh, into an eternal life. There is nothing like that. But there is the bread, Jesus Christ. And when we participate in the bread of Jesus Christ, that unleavened bread of hypocrisy, we can live eternally. Our body will still die, but we have an immortal soul that will be taken and saved by Jesus Christ based on the life we've lived, a, a life of no leaven, hypocrisy. Leaven not only is cor correlated with hypocrisy, but also with sin in general. And we know that from 1 Corinthians 5, 7 through 8. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And that's what they want us to know. Thus we become new lumps if we clean out the leaven of sin from our lives. And we can only do this through the power of Jesus Christ. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us 
of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. And ye know that he was manifest to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. 1 John 3, 5. And so Jesus comes and he takes the leaven out of our life because he's the only one who can really take it out. But we offer up our lives. We give over our will and choose to follow him. As tradition tells us, the unleavened bread that the Israelites were to eat when it was made, was bruised, striped, and pierced, and called the bread of affliction. We can see that literal fulfillment of this in Isaiah's prophecy about Jesus. And if we go to Isaiah 53, verses 5 and 10, But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, and he hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. And so, again, we see he took on our sin. He, he became sin for us to cleanse us. And he was wounded for us. Uh, he was bruised for us. His chastisement, his piercing was for us. Uh, that we might have a, a hope, a chance. And so in his choosing to go through all of that, as it said in the, the, the last part of that, uh, he shall see his seed. He did that for our sakes, and in doing that, he has uh, children. We are his children in that we follow that same path. Of course, today we carry on the traditions of the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, by making a covenant with Christ in the waters of baptism and participating in the sacrament. As Jesus demonstrated to his disciples, and he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. And that's found in Luke 22, 19 and 20. And also... Uh, in 1 Corinthians 11:26, For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do shew the Lord's death till he come. And that's what it's about. It's about remembering what he did for us. It's about remembering that covenant, taking on his body, taking on the blood, and becoming pure new loves. Thus we search out the leaven and sin in our homes or lives, and we get rid of it through repentance. As such, we are coming out of Egypt, or the world, and becoming children of God by adoption. And we refresh our memory, as we refresh our memory of our promise in baptism, by participating in the sacrament of bread and wine, remembering Christ's death and resurrection, and how it covers our sin so long as we continue to follow Him. And so there's, there's just like the, the tradition in the Jews, every year they clean their house, every year they searched out the leaven, Thus, in our own life, it tells us there's a continuation. Constantly, we need to examine our own lives. Constantly, we need to remove the leaven out of our life. Uh, constantly, the devil's going to be going and putting leavened crumbs of bread in our homes. And we need to search it out. We need to get it out. There are several events that took place on these dates when we think about the, the parable of unleavened bread. Of course, one of those was uh, the exodus out of Egypt happened in during this time period. Christ's burial happened during this time period. And uh, interestingly enough, the fall of the Jewish resistance at Masada in 73 AD also happened in this period when Israel as a people basically ended for almost 2,000 years. It wasn't until in the uh, uh, 1900s that Israel was restored as a country. And so we have this period when God punished his people because they didn't see the Messiah. He walked among them, he lived among them, they couldn't see it. Even though they ate the bread of affliction and could see his fulfilling of it, no matter how many of these feasts pointed at him, they couldn't see it. And today, too often, people can get wrapped up in wanting to go back and follow the Jewish traditions. And essentially what we're doing, again, is we're missing the point. We're taking our eyes off Jesus, like Peter did when he was walking on water. They're taking their eyes off the Messiah, off the Master, 
and they're sinking. It's not about the feast. It's not about the, the, the feast of unleavened bread. It's about Jesus. It's about what he did. It's about his life. It's about everything he did for us. And we focus on him, and we do these things because it's what he set for us. Thank you for this time. Thank you for participating.